afternoon, everybody. How you doing? It's good to see some uh, all your faces here today. It's wonderful. It's such a joy to see you all. We're going to worship our Heavenly Father. So I want you to just rise with me here if you're able. Let's, uh, let's uh, pray together and as we begin our worship here. Praise you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you, King Jesus, for all that you have done and are doing here in our midst. And Lord, we just pray for all those here today, Jesus, that we come to honor you with our lips and our bodies as a sacrifice of praise to you, Jesus, because you are worthy of it all. We thank you, Lord, for your sal- our salvation that we have through you, King Jesus, your death on the cross, and most importantly, your resurrection, that we know we will rise with you that day when you call upon the, everyone to come up in the clouds. We praise you, Jesus. May we honor you today in this worship here in the message, and uh, may you have your will done in our midst. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.
inside of me. Let it rise. Let fever rise. We'll see. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch you die and fall. Hope you can not survive when we pray. That's right. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lifts in heart. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 this is what. This is what leading looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what leaving looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what leaving looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wash right. We'll watch the giant fall. Hope you cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lives in heart. Put all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Hope you cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lives in heart. With all creation cry, God, we praise you.
just storms may wait for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life.
We love you, Lord, for your promises. We love you for your faithfulness. You're so wonderful, King Jesus. Thank you for this time here in your presence, Jesus. And to honor you and worship you with our lips and our bodies of praise. Lord Jesus, as we continue here with the message of my brother, Lord Jesus, you would bring him the words to speak to edify the body here and that we may leave here changed and new. Please be with the children as they go back to, to learn more about you, Jesus, that you would guard their hearts and their minds and lead them closer to you, Jesus. We praise it and pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Hallelujah. All the time, God is good. Well, guys, if you're standing right now, feel free to say hello to somebody, stretch your legs, and then we'll be back just in a bit with the message. You're listening to Hope for Today Church Podcast. We're so glad that you're joining in this virtual space. We believe that as you listen, Jesus will minister to you right where you are. So open up your mind and your heart to what the Word would say to you today. Thank you for joining us. And remember, Jesus is our hope for today. So glad that you're here um, this afternoon. We're going to get back into Galatians. Um, last two weeks, we took a bit of a detour um, by, I believe, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, what was going on in the world's events. Um, and I need to be faithful in going to this part of Scripture. Um, it's a part of the Word of God that is true and it's relative to every day, everything that we face, the good, the bad, the ugly, the whole nine yards as believers uh, in the Lord. And we're, we're, it's important that we're real with one another and we're real with the word as the word speaks to us um, today. So in Galatians 4, just so we can understand the setup for Galatians 5 that we're in today, I'm going to allow the Apostle Paul and the words that he penned to speak to you today. So imagine as if you are in the Decapolis uh, in Athens or you're somewhere within the region, more importantly, the region of Galatia, I should say, uh, and you're in that region and this letter is being circulated and it's being spoken to crowds and groups of people and maybe even those who are meeting in, uh, in small groups. And so they get this letter, they receive this letter. Paul has spoken to the believers of Galatia before. He's writing to them again, and he begins to talk about their sonship and their daughtership as members of the family of God. And in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. Think how great that sounds. You are an heir. An heir of something is typically a good thing. That means something has been left for you to partake in, to enjoy. And then Paul continues and he shows a bit of concern for them. And he says, but in the past, since you didn't know God, you were enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. By now, since you know God or rather have become known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elements? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? You are observing, a special, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years I am fearful for you that perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. I beg you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I also become like you. You have not wronged me, however. You know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. You did not despise or reject me through my physical condition, though it was a trial for you. On the contrary, you received me as an angel of God, as Jesus Christ himself. Where then is your blessing? For I testify to you, if possible, you would have torn out your eyes and give them to me. So then, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? They court you eagerly, but not for good. They wanted to exclude you from me so that you would pursue them. 
but it's always good to be pursued in a good manner and not just when I am with you. My children, I am again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be with you right now and to change my tone of voice because I don't know what to do about you. Then Paul goes on, he continues to write, showing them exactly what this sonship looks like, how they are truly heirs. They are children of God. They've been grafted in the promise, spoken to Abraham, that his seed, that is Jesus Christ, is the promise. And all who profess faith in Christ have become heirs. And in verse 28, he says, Now you two brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as then the child born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the spirit, so also now. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we're not children of a slave, but of the free woman. And here the Apostle Paul is speaking about when Abraham and Sarah took in their own hands to conceive a child because they were growing impatient with God's plan. And so they conceived a child not of God's uh, a plan, and that was Ishmael, and that was the one in which the Lord said to send that son out, that the descendants of that child, they are not heirs of the kingdom. They are not the heirs of the promise. But like Isaac, he's a child of promise. So also those who put their faith in the Lord will also be children of promise. And then Paul continues to go on and writes, he goes, listen, for freedom, Christ has set us free and stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so at this point, he set up beautifully that there are those that we looked at before. They've come in and they've sought to infiltrate their ranks, to put them into slavery, to put upon them, to make them think as somehow they've missed out, that God has held out on them, and for them to experience the goodness of God, the, the fullness of his kingdom that's promised to them, they need to involve themselves in rituals and practices in order to show themselves as acceptably before God. And then Paul goes on and says, guys, in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. And he begins to call them out saying, you know, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from believing the truth? And he reiterates again in verse 13 of chapter 5, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. You know, in many respects, it's not different from today. We want to outdo one another. We like to shine. We like the, the good things that we get. And if we're thinking about being uh, recipients of a promise, you know, we want to get more than the person to our left and to our right. And Paul's saying here, for many intents and purposes, you're all equal. You're all receiving the same promise. You know, don't think you're better than the person sitting to your left and to your right because none of you are able to accomplish this and be received and accepted by the Father on your own. There's nothing you can do to be accepted as good graces. It's all through faith in Jesus. So stop trying to outdo one another. Stop trying to say, hey man, I got this thing figured out and you gotta get your act together. But he says to love one another and so you fulfill the law. You know, when you look at this part of scripture, Paul is showing us very, very well that he is a one of, a, of authority. He's been called by Jesus, as we looked at several weeks ago, that he received this revelation, this disclosure from Jesus Christ himself. And you can see the tone of this grace message. He's being firm, but it's still the grace message. He's speaking, he's being unwavering in his commitment to the purity of this gospel. We see not only in how he's explained this as he's written to the people of Galatia, but earlier in chapter 3, we, show, we saw his pastoral heart and how he reproved Peter. 
who Peter, for all intents and purposes, to make a long story short, he was a Jew. And he came from that way of living and, and going through the sacrifices to be acceptable before God, going through the law of Moses. But the thing with the law of Moses, we're told in Galatians 3.10, that unless you obey the entire law, you are under a curse if you do not fulfill every letter of the law. And so although Peter claimed to affirm the justification through grace, through faith for all who believe, when these other Jews, these Judaizers came to Galatia, he began to pull away from the Galatians. He wouldn't eat with them. He wouldn't sit with them. He wouldn't hang out with them. And so rightfully so, pastorally, Paul approached Peter and, and taught him and reminded him of this grace message. And so we walked away to bring us full circle. We walked away with the importance that still speaks to us this afternoon, not to shoot down the godly messengers in our life. You know, those who are anointed with, with the, the Holy Spirit and because of love desire to exhort you in the things of God. You know, whenever you're corrected in something, I've been there, we've all been there, it's never easy to hear, is it? You know, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, you know, Show yourself approved, but also go and correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. It's never easy to approach another, even when you love them so much. And so in this letter, Paul is making no apologies about it. Don't let anyone dissuade you. There is no other way to the Father. There is no other way to be accepted by God. You can put down the works of the flesh. It's not going to count. What counts is your faith in Jesus and in Christ alone. Don't be deceived in attempting anything else to justify yourself. So for all intents and purposes, this is the ongoing recycling theme throughout not only this letter, but all of Penn are Paul's letters. And if you want to walk away here with a little bit of a simple buzzword, that grace through faith in Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, you look online... And there's a lot of debates happening, a lot of um, conversations um, happening. And, you know, it's right here, this letter to the Apostle Paul shows us that we're not different from the time of his, his time. The, the battling, the bickering, the debating with one another about the things that one must do to be in good standing with God. Maybe you've heard this along the way. You might be saved in Christ, but are you a disciple? Are you saved, but are you a disciple? And it's all this semantics. If you're saved, you're a follower of Christ. You've believed by the confession of your faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and so you're a follower in the Lord because you're putting your faith in him. And yet today, in some respects, there has appeared this two-tier system of Christianity. Here Paul is speaking against this two-tier level of Christianity. We're all sons and daughters. Look what he says in Galatians 3, 26. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Jesus Christ. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs of according to the promise. And so if you leave here today and someone says to you, if you don't pray 24-7 on your knees for the people of Israel, you are under a curse and therefore you are no longer under the blessing and promise of God, that's a lie. That's one of the lies. Number two, when someone comes along and says to you, hey, you know what, I, it, it's great that you began that journey and you've, you've given your life to Jesus, but unless you go through these hoops, so to speak, an engagement in, in the righteous life of, of godly living and they specifically start checking the boxes, like, like Paul goes on in Galatians 5 and says, hey, unless you abstain from envy and, and drunkenness and the whole nine, whole nine yards, then you are under a curse and you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But we take Paul's words out of context. He says in 519, he says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. He says, sexual morality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts, and the list goes on. 
And then he starts to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And he identifies it as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But he's emphasizing throughout his whole entire letter that if you put your life, if you put your stock in these works and see, seeking to uh, justify yourself, it's not going to work. You're going to fall short. But then if you, if you take the, the truth of the word and let it wash over you by leading the spirit, you will do as he writes to the believers in Romans, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's very simple. But in Galatians, there was this infight and there was a lot of backstepping going on because the people were unsure of themselves. Just like us, when someone comes along and says, are, are you really saved? You know, I've noticed some of the fruit's a little bit lacking today. Now, at the end of the day, we know that God is judged. He's aware of your heart. Just like with David, he says, I don't look at the exterior, I look at the heart. He knows whether you denied Christ or not. Now, some may walk around and say, well, the fruit in their life is evidence that they denied Christ. But the true blasphemy, according to the word, Jesus Christ himself, if you can deny me in front of the Father, I will deny you. So here, Paul is reiterating. At the end of the day, he says, at the end of the fruit of the Spirit, now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. What I appreciate, what I so desperately love about this is that we all come in equal to the kingdom of God. Because of faith, we enter together as one family because of one hope, one baptism. The way I see the return of Christ, I, I'm saying this is not as a, as a word from the Lord, similar to how the Apostle Paul would say, you know, this is from me, this is not from the Lord. But I imagine where he says in Galatians, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the return of the Lord, he says it'll be like a flash, and the, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I like to look at it in a way that because of faith, the moment that our dearly departed close their eyes and their spirit is with the Lord, that the moment that our Lord and Savior returns, if we are alive when he returns, we're hoping that's the case, that we will enter his glorious presence at the exact same time, equal, because of one faith, one hope. There's no two-tiered system. No two-tiered system. By faith in Jesus. He, Paul talks about this heir of promise. Think about it. By faith in Jesus, we are heirs of that promise, that, that wellspring of this resurrection life also that Paul talks about with the fruit of the Spirit. So what he's emphasizing here as he gets into chapter 6 as we set this thing up, is he's saying, put to rest all the works of the flesh you're trying to do to be accepted before God. It's not going to happen. You can't do it in your, in your own strength and power. But because of what Christ has done, now that you've been rest assured in your salvation and now keep in step with the Spirit who says you're a new creation, you're a new man, you're a new woman in Christ. And just as we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, do we not experience the same power of his presence and counselship? And as we go to chapter 6, momentarily. John 14, 12. I love to revisit this passage of scripture. Jesus Christ says, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will do the works that I do and even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. And the reason why I share that as we go into chapter 6, when we are looking at walking with one another and carrying each other's burdens, we can only truly be victorious in helping carry each other's burdens by the power of the Spirit. But as we call out to the Lord and we're asking him to work in our midst, he's only going to do what's in accordance with his will, what's in accordance with the purpose of his will for our lives. He's not a genie in the bottle that if you rub him the right way, he's going to give you what the desire of your heart is. The scripture says, I will give you the desires of your heart if you walk in my ways and my wills and my statutes. 
So let's go to Galatians chapter 6 for a moment. And as we read through these, uh, these words, as the Apostle Paul writes to us, I ask you this question. Will the Lord deny you when you call out to be delivered from temptation to the flesh? Will he deny you in that request to be delivered from said temptation? So look at Galatians 6. He goes on after telling the people not to provoke one or not to think you're greater than everyone else. In chapter 6, he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in such a wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you are also not tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work. Then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Let the one who was taught the word share all good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to the flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. Let us not grow tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. This is probably one of the most difficult aspects of Scripture to live out. We live in a time where we see the days are evil, the, the pressure of the end of our, of our souls, in some respects has ramped up the offensive, in many respects has even infiltrated church life, has infiltrates the thought life, can't possess you if you're in Christ, but you can better believe he will seek to oppress you as much as he possibly can. And so as we read these, this part of the letter from Paul to the Galatians, Paul is speaking from this place of this deep reservoir of understanding the grace of God, that very power in his own life. He's experienced the, the freedom of God, the refreshing drink that came from Jesus Christ. He said, whoever believes in me will not thirst, and out of him will flow rivers of living water. And so Paul, he, he pursued the, the people. He deeply cared for them like a father for a child wanting the best for his child. How many of you as parents would deny your children good gifts? How many of you want bad things for your children? None of us would do such a thing. I think about my own daughter when, when she comes and she shares some things. Maybe she wants to paint her room a really horrific color or she just wants to do something absolutely bizarre. And because of love, I, I pursue her and I, I ask her to, to rethink her requests. You know, what benefit is this going to be for you? In many ways, this is how it is for us in our faith. As we're honest with the Holy Spirit, Paul is putting the emphasis on relying on the Holy Spirit as we walk with each other and, other and the burdens that we face. And if we're honest with one another and honest with the Holy Spirit that prompts us, we will make the right decision. It's important we don't make this about ourselves. It's important we don't think that we take care of the results. Paul said this to Timothy. He said, look, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ might demonstrate his ordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. I believe that Paul understood what it was to misstep. I believe Paul understood the, the life that of an old creation and the goodness of being a new creation and why would you ever want to return or backpedal? But the world is so good at making you think you're missing out. You know, if you're unhappy or this or that, you can just change course. But here, Paul is saying, like, look, just like anything is permissible for you, he goes on to say, look, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Why not sow the things of the Spirit that, that you reap life? Why reap destruction? You think about decisions that we make. 
Just, just be color for a moment. Think about all the decisions you've made in your life. And I would almost guarantee you in the moment, if you inquire the Lord in some of those decisions, you could say, Lord, if, if I just listened to your still voice, I would have avoided a lot of the consequence. And yet, thankfully, his word says that even in temptation, just as much as we face sin, that he is there. And we're able to bear it. He doesn't allow us to be completely and utterly destroyed with no hope. But we have to learn from these uh, circumstances, don't we? Paul learned from his circumstance. He learned what it was to be in rebellion to God. And then God got a hold of him. Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus got a hold of him, opened his eyes to everything that he would experience by the power of the Lord. And so he's operating from that place of assurance of the grace of God, the great power that is sufficient as we look to him. But at times we can think, man, I'm untouchable. Sometimes we put stock and strength in ourselves, And so Paul's saying, be realistic as you see your brother and sister struggling. Don't think you got everything figured out. You're not the answer to their problem. Holy Spirit is the answer to the problem as you walk with them and encourage them in those matters of issues. Verse 9, he says, let us not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. We have each other, don't we? Look at the end of that statement there. Work for the opportunity, work for every opportunity, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. We are not in this alone. We have one another. We're supposed to be able to count on one another. Yeah, we have the, the provision of heaven. Don't misunderstand. We have the provision of heaven as we sing about this this afternoon that we can demolish strongholds, but we are not in or at the table by ourselves. We are to count on one another. Let us work for the good of all. I have to tell you in conversations as a pastor, and even in my own life, there's so many times that when things are happening, it can be convenient to turn aside the word of God. But it's so, it's so true and, and relatable, but it's, it's difficult at the same time because culture says things very differently. Culture affirms very different things. But here I believe Paul shows us that even when it's difficult and tough, if we truly love our neighbor as ourself, you would speak to them as you would hope others would speak to you. You would encourage them to follow the prompting of the Spirit. You know, I get, I'm burying my soul here. This, this message in time as a church, we're not even streaming today, and I think I know why. We need to draw together as a church family and to pray for one another because, you know, the days are evil. You know, without getting into details, there's, there's times where, you know, people you would never think could um, be swayed, can be swayed. We're all susceptible to the sin agents uh, at work the work of the devil. And I, I think of the word in Hebrews 10, the only other verse I've written here this afternoon. It says, let us draw near to the Lord. Let us hold to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promises faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. When we go through things, when we go through struggle, we need to press into the family of God and not remain on the outs. There's so many times where I've experienced shortfalls and error in my own life and I found peace, I found strength in the family of God. You look and see at world events and tragic events, whether it's 9-11 and so forth, people would run to the church for that community and, and camaraderie and looking for hope. 
But in Romans 15, the Apostle Paul says, pray for me. Pray for me in my ministry as you are reminded to pray for one another. Because Jesus says this in Mark 14, 38, Stay awake and pray so you won't enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. God can work miracles. Do you believe that? God can work miracles. You know, we're going to do stuff very, very differently here this afternoon. Uh, John told me as he was finishing worship that he lost his voice. Um, and so I want us to pray for one another. Um, this is a very private, intimate thing. This isn't being live streamed or anything uh, like that, like I said, because of technology. But I think that's very intentional um, for us to take time to pray for one another, to also stand in proxy for those um, that are on our heart. I will tell you this. The, the enemy of our souls... Does not, want the, does not want this assembly to succeed. It's very, very clear. The last few weeks, it's been so apparent in words spoken. You know, um, I, I can't give you all the details, but it is so apparent that he wants to dismantle this work because we are proclaiming the truth of God's word. And Satan knows the word. He knows the power of the truth. He wants, to, he wants to deceive, kill, and destroy. But we stand for hope for today. We believe that, yeah, things are never easy. It, you know, there might be moments where you're not even happy. But it's not about happiness. It's about the joy and peace that you have in the Lord and what he calls us to. The good works that he calls us to. But the enemy is on the offensive. And he is seeking to knock us down. And if he can knock us down one by one, he's going to try. He's going to try. Think about it. If Lucifer, the worshiper of heaven, can be knocked down, he can come after anyone. That's why we need one another. We're equally going to be tempted. Temptation is common to us all. But if we keep in step with the Spirit, if we encourage one another and the burdens that we face, we can overcome. Because what did we look at last week? That we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So let's not deny the power of his name together. Let's pray for one another and encourage one another. If you know your brother or sister is struggling, encourage them. Don't just give them chapter and verse, but encourage them. So what I want to invite you to do, and I'm going to get off this mic here, um, but I want you to, if you could, we just get together into a group, and we're going to pray for each other. And uh, in, in that circle, as we prompt one another, um, I want to encourage you to take the lead as the Spirit leads to call out um, if there's names or that on, or situations on your mind and also to think of the church. Um, we are, we're not going to give up without a fight. We are not going to stop. I believe the Lord wants us to work and he wants us to continue doing the good work even when it's not easy. Amen. And so I'm going to invite you. We're again in a circle here, and it's very different.